seems to be a very appropriate series to be in right now, right? Uh, that we had not planned on or thought about. It just kind of worked its was way around. It's our second lesson, and uh, we're going to do another one this weekend. And uh, it's going to be really good this weekend. Be really good. I've already done the lesson. It's really good. So miracles. I said to you, or we said to you this weekend... Here, here at the West and also at the East and, and the other churches we have, that miracles and belief in them and for them are part of our Christian heritage and legacy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, you saw on the weekend, it says that God has set in the church the working of miracles. So the miracles did not pass away with the Old Testament, in fact, they've been set in the church. Wherever there is a church, there's the potential for miracles. Wherever the church exists, there's a potential for miracles. Hey, why not believe in them? Why not believe for them? You know, I've, I've been believing in miracles and believing in for miracles now for over 45 years, and no one has ever come and given me a bill. So what do I mean by that? It's free to believe. So you're going to believe something. Did you hear what I just said to you? I said you're going to believe something. Humans are never in a place of non-belief. You're in a place of belief or unbelief, but you're never in a place of non-belief. You're always believing what God says, or you're choosing to believe the opposite of what God says, but you're believing something. So why not believe in and believe for miracles? Why not? Amen. Right? You're believing anyway. Am I helping anybody? Does that make sense to you? You're believing anyway. Why not believe for miracles in your life? Why not believe for them? Amen. So we've been looking. We started looking at them. And one of the great statements I think I've ever said to you was this, that in truth, everything Jesus died for is available to everyone for whom he died. So I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Do you believe Jesus died for you? Amen. Well, if Jesus died for you, then everything he died for is available to you. Amen. You are not discounted. You are not cut out of it. Miracles. Now, here's what we're focusing on right now in this study. Miracles are not mysterious. They're not haphazard. They're not mystical or magical. Miracles happen to people who are in pursuit of God. Who are moving towards Him. That are leaning in. Whatever term you want to use, that's where miracles happen. And we learned this past weekend that one of the key ingredients that causes miracles to happen in Scripture, is obedience. Right? We saw it in the life of Moses on the weekend in the nation of Israel, right? Obedience. So let's go look at a couple of miracles tonight. And we've got, we're going to cover six chapters tonight of one book. Are you ready? All right, so go with me, and I'll give you a moment to get there, to the book of Daniel. Oh, ho, ho. So a lot of you know a couple of the miracles we're going to look at tonight. Are you ready? We're going to go quick. I mean, we got a bunch of territory to cover. I've got 25 mi What? Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm going to summarize a lot of verses for you. I'm going to give you the verses. You can go and look at them. You can back up what I say. I would encourage you to do that. That's why I always like you to bring your own Bible. I, 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 never, I never tell people, you know, don't read your Bible. No, I want you to check me out. Read it yourself. All right? But in Daniel chapter 1, verses through 21, I will summarize for you. We are told that Judah, the nation of Judah, is taken into captivity by the reigning world power at the time, Babylon. All right? They're taken into captivity. In chapter 1, verse 3, right? We see that the king spoke unto the master of the eunuchs that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the, and of the king's seed and of the princes. 
So he left some of the people, he, he captured Israel, but he left some of the people there to take care of it. But then some of the royal family, he brought back with him to Babylon. All right? And children in verse 4, in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such had the ability to stand them in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. So what you see here is, is that these were young men, all right, that were very educated. And I just want to just make a comment tonight, right? Let's always place a premium on education. Let's never discount it. Can I get a good amen today, right? Let's never discount it. Let's always put a premium on it. You know, I made, the, and they will tell you this, and they didn't love me when I did it, but I made my kids go to college and get their degrees. They didn't want to. They wanted to just go straight to work in the church. And, you know, their mom and I could have hired them, but I said, no. No, you're going to go get your degree. Yes. Yes. And you're going you're gonna to have that. You're going to have that available to you. And, and when you talk to people, you're going to be able to tell them, I've got a degree, because that matters to a lot of people. It's a big deal. Right? And it was a big deal here. If it wasn't a big deal, it wouldn't have been recorded. So encourage your kids in that way. Come on, give me a good amen tonight. Right? And yourself. I think we should, I think we should be lifelong learners. Right? And so I point that out to you tonight because I want you to see, as we read about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that these were, they were there because they were a part of that. They were part of that royal family, and they were educated, and they were taught, and they, they're brought there to Babylon. But now I want you to see something that, that's really fascinating. Look at verse 17, and it's for the four children. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and da Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, can I just drop this thought on you tonight? You ought to be praying that over yourself and your kids. Because notice, notice who gave it to them. God gave it to them. And if God could give it to them, can he not give it to you? And can he not give it to your kids and your grandkids? Amen. Hmm? If you're not praying that, well, then start now. Start tonight. And start praying that over yourself and, and asking God, God, give us, God, give us knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And give us understanding of visions and dreams. Give us understanding of it. Why not? Hmm? That's better than walking around. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, everybody in my family's dumb, and we never amount to much, and we don't get very far. And, 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 okay, well, you know, that may be true of everybody in your family, but, you know, can I just give you a, maybe a good idea tonight? Start your own family tree. Don't keep being a branch on that tree. Go start your own tree. Hmm? I remember when my parents said to me, you know, once I got turned on things of God and you know, I can say this now because they're in heaven. You know, they don't care anymore, right? But I remember, and I, you know, they were good, and I loved them. But, you know, you can love them and still not get them. And, uh, you know, and they said to me once, they said, you know, I still don't understand why you want to be so different than the rest of us. And, you know, they said, you know, you are part of this family. And I said, well, yeah, I know I am, and I love you, and I respect you. I said, but what maybe you need to understand is I'm not a branch on that tree anymore. I've started my own tree. And that's no disrespect to your tree, but I've started my own tree. Thank you very much. And we're going to bear different fruit over here. Huh? So what did your parents say? I can't repeat that all. Amen. That's okay. We got our tree. All right? Now, look at... Uh, Look, back up with me to verse 9. I forgot to show you this verse. you got to see this. And God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Now, I want you to see this, right? He brought them into this kind of favor. And you saw just a moment ago, right, over there we were reading. And the king, in verse 19, the king 
commune, commune, commune with them, and among them was found none like David, right? And then there's the Hebrew names, and then, you know, he changes their other names to the to name. And all manner of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of him and found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. Ten times better. So I just want to drop this thought on you tonight, right? So I thought you were going to talk about miracles. Well, to me, this is miraculous. Because here's these four young boys separated from their family, separated from their culture, right? And they're in a land where people don't like them, don't understand them, and yet they get promoted. Right? And yet they find this favor. Now I looked up that word favor, and I've never seen it before. And the, the reference book said this is one of the most important words in the Old Testament. Wow. So we need to really pay attention to this word. It means acts of kindness, love, or mercy, listen, shown to a person that is usually reserved for close friends and family members when no formal relationship has previously existed. So a favor that would have only been given by the prince of the eunuchs to family members or close friends, he gives supernaturally to Daniel. Right? A favor that should have never come his way came his way. Why? 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 Huh? I believe because God gave it to him. God's bringing Daniel out, bringing him into this place. I want to say to you again tonight, if De God can do it for Daniel in a foreign land among people that don't get him, don't understand him, can do it for him, do it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, why can't he do it for you? Why can't he do it for your children here in El Paso or wherever? Come on, give the Lord a better hand clap than that. Amen? Let's believe for it. Let's believe for this to happen, right? Okay, let's go into chapter 2 now. All right, now you can read about this starting in verse 1 and all the way through verse 19. Okay, again, I'm going to summarize. The king has a dream, and it's a very perplexing dream, and it terrorizes him, and he wakes up in the morning and he's afraid. So he calls his magicians in and tells them, give me the interpretation of the dream. They said, tell us the dream. He said, I can't remember it. But if you're as smart as you claim to be, you can find out what the dream is and then interpret it so I have peace. And they said, no one can do what you're asking us to do. He said, no problem. If you don't have this available by tomorrow, I'm going to kill all of you. <laughs> so Daniel, who is a part of the king's council, is motivated. Hey, I just had a thought. Sometimes, you, you know, to see a miracle, you need to have good motivation. Right? So Daniel goes to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and says, boys, you can go home and read. It's pretty good. He says, boys, we got to pray. Because God knows the dream and God knows the interpretation of the dream. And God showed Daniel. So Daniel comes back the next morning and tells the king the dream and the interpretation of the dream. Right? Now look what happens in verse 46. Okay? It's really something. Chapter 2, verse 46 then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Whoa. And commanded that they should offer a, an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing you could reveal the secret. Then the king made David a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler, oh my gosh, over the whole province of Babylon, chief of the governors and over all the wise men of Babylon. Then David requested of the king that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also be put over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But David sat in the gate of the king. So... Again, we see this supernatural promotion. I'm going to remind you again tonight, I cannot get over this. In a culture that was against them, they were not Persians. 
They were Hebrews. They were made fun of and disrespected. And yet, they get promoted. If God can do that for them, why aren't we believing the same for you and your loved ones and your company and your business? Amen? It's a matter of believing and expecting, right? All four of them promote. Okay, let's go to chapter 3. All right? Beginning in verse 1. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, are you learning anything now? It's going to get really good now. Now we're going to get into the two big miracles. Well, those were pretty big. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of God, of gold, excuse me, whose height and weight and all that stuff. Then he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sat together. The princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, all the rulers of the provinces come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And guess who the image was of? Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> then the princes and the governors and all of them together at the dedication were there and they set it up and they cried out and they said, from now on, when you hear the music play, you will bow to the image of Nebuchadnezzar and you will worship him. And if you don't, we will throw you into the fiery furnace. Now, I find this fascinating, absolutely fascinating, because in chapter 2, verse 46 through 49, the same king had said that Dave, Daniel's God was God. Right. But now, he's God. It's quite an observation. Quite interesting when you think how amazing and how quickly men change how they see themselves when their problems disappear. When he had a problem, he was all humble and your God is God. Once the problem goes away, well, I'm not so sure your God was God. I think maybe it was me. Hmm? Kind of fascinating. All right? Now, watch this, chapter 12. There were certain of the Jews who had set over the affairs of the province, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, the king, and they came to the king because they played the music and these guys didn't bow. How many of you heard the story before, right? There used to be an old song, right? They didn't bow, they didn't bend, and they didn't burn. So the province, and they, and they tell the king, these men didn't regard you. They don't serve our gods, nor worship the golden image which you set up. My family... We are always surrounded with jealous people. Don't be surprised if you encounter these people. Great, 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 great grandchildren. They may be living in El Paso. All right? Don't be surprised. I always find it surprising when I talk to Christian people, and they're like, you know, God's blessing me, and these people are mad. Okay, well, you're in a long line of people that have been blessed, and there was a few that get mad about it. Go on and enjoy the blessing, and don't worry about them. But they call me this. Well, are you that? No. Okay, well, then go on with your life. I've been called everything in the world but what I am. You know, just the other day, I had somebody come and say, well, how were these people, and they called you this, and I said... I said, okay. And they said, well, does that make you mad? I said, no, I, I'm not that. So what does that matter to you? I <laughs> don't care. I'm going to enjoy God's blessing. So they bring him before the king. The king gets really upset, really angry. Verse 13. And he takes them. Now, there's something here I want you to see, right? Where, what verse is it, Charles? Verse 15. He looks at him and says, now, I'm going to play the music. And if you fall down and worship them that I've made, well, but if you worship not, then you should be cast into the fire. Now watch. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So what he was saying there was, you know, the God you got, he's pretty good about wisdom, but he doesn't have power. He's a nice God for wisdom, but he can't deliver you from me. Hmm? 
Now, here it comes. Are you ready? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. In other words, they're saying, we've given this a lot of thought. We know what's in line, what's on stake, and we're being respectful. If it be so, our God, whom we are serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Bada boom, bada boom. Huh? I said, one way or the other today, we're being delivered from you. All right? But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Now, in the literal text, a lot of the scholars say that it reads like this. If you choose to throw us in the fire, God will deliver us. If you choose not to throw us in the fire, God will still deliver us. Either way, we are not going to bow to you. Now, I point that out to you because the pressure to compromise is enormous. I've had it on my life, and I'm sure you've had it on your life. The pressure, the pressure to compromise, to cave in, right? To give in. So, they're there. You have a nice God, but he's a powerless God. But they see, they feel that pressure, and they refuse to give in to that pressure. And I'm going to say it to you. I believe we all are tempted to compromise at times in our lives. In order to get ahead or to keep our position or to stay with somebody socially or to be with the right group at work, etc. And I ask this question. Can God take care of us when we are obeying him? Can God take care of us? All right. So he chunks them in the fire. Right? And he looks down there and he sees, wow, four men in the fire. And he says that fourth man looks like the Son of God. I think we were singing that. Were we singing a song about that tonight? I think we were. All right? Verse 21. Then these men were bound in their coats their, and and holes in their hats and other garments and were cast in the midst of the fiery furnace. Therefore came the king's commandment was urgent. The furnace was exceeding hot. The flame of the fire slew the men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, rose up in haste and spoke and said to his counselors, did we not throw three men bound in the midst of the fire? They said, oh yes, we did, king. He answered and said, well, come and look. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Right? Is that a big wow, or is that a big wow? I think that's a big wow. Huh? I think that's a wow. Now look at 27. And the princes, the governor, da, 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 saw these men upon whom bodies of fire had no power, nor was a hair on their head singed, nor were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them, which means they came up and smelled them. It's a little weird, right? A little weird. Hey, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that at times we also will go through fire because of our faith and our obedience to God. Sounds corny. I don't mean to sound that way, but believe there's a fourth man in the fire with you too. Amen? Amen. Don't just sing this song. Believe that song. Uh, some of you tonight may be in the fire. We may be in the fire right now as a nation. I don't know. But I believe that we are not by ourselves. I believe that God is on our side. I believe that God is going to take us through. And I believe that we can see the fourth man in the fire. Amen? Amen? So we may go through the fire. Now look at verse 28. This is good. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's back. Right? 
who sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. The power of no compromise being met by a miracle. I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. <laughs> and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. <laughs> then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So again, they're promoted. Would that promotion have come if they had compromised? No. Would this miracle have happened if they had compromised? No. Hey, just a thought, and then we're going we're to finish up. Are you glad you came tonight? Is this making good sense to you? Hmm? Don't compromise. Give your God, let me rephrase that, give your miracle-working God a chance. Don't compromise. All right. You can go home tonight and look at chapter 5, verse 31, 30 and 31, and you'll discover that in chapter 5, Babylon gets a new king. All right? And uh, the other king that replaced this king, so this is two more kings down the road, the king that replaced Nebuchadnezzar gets killed. He's replaced by a new king called Darius. He took over the kingdom. Right? And so he takes over and he sets himself up. He's got a new king. Great. Daniel, in verses 1, beginning in here, gets promoted again. Gets promoted again. Here's an interesting statistic. They believe Daniel went into Babylon when he was about 16 or 17. He died at 80. He outlived everybody. That was a long life in those days. Okay? So he's there. In verse 4, he's met with more jealousy by the guys around him. So they get the king to pass a new law. And the new law is you will only worship the god Darius. You know, they just keep recycling the old stuff, right? So they bring it out again. Of course, that feel, feeds Darius's ego. But they, they give up on the fiery furnace. That didn't work good the last time. So they got a new king with a new law and a new threat. And the new threat is, we got a lion's den. Now, he may be able to deliver you from fire, but he ain't going to deliver you from the lions. So you're going to bow down and worship the God we tell you to worship. Well, Daniel goes home, opens his windows, turns towards Jerusalem, and prays to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. No compromise, no disrespect. He, you know, he didn't, he didn't do it in the palace. How many of you hear what I'm saying, right? He went home, privacy of his own house. And he's praying. These guys are outside the windows. They're listening. All right? And they don't like it. So Daniel obeyed God. Why? Because in Exodus chapter 20, verse 23, it says, And you shall not bow down to any golden images of any gods. I'm the only true God, and you will, and you will bow down before me. Right? And so Daniel says, okay, great. So verse 16 King commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, watch this, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Daniel doesn't say that. Darius says that. So he wakes up. He realizes he's been played. It's amazing how God can bring the truth out when we refuse to compromise. Amen? Obedience obedience Amen. obedience puts us in place for miracles to happen Amen. in our lives Amen. don't let the devil lie to you hmm? obey and i'm almost out of time 
Here we go. Can we finish this up? You might as well say amen because we're going to, all right? But it won't take long, right? I love that, that he looks at him and says, your God will deliver you. So he cast him in. They put a stone, right? And the king went to his palace, verse 18, passed the night fasting. Wow. Didn't sleep at all. King got up first thing in the morning, ran to the den of lions. When he came in, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. I'm in verse 20. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God, whom you serve continually, able to deliver you from the lions? Poor guy, right? You can just hear his voice. Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths. And they have not heard me. For as much as before him innocency, innocency was found in me. And also before you, king, I've done no hurt. Watch. Then the king was exceeding glad for him and commanded they should take him out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him. Watch. Here's the key verse, because he believed in his God. So I ask you tonight, do you believe in your God? I said, do you believe in your God? Can I give you one more thought? If you've got some lions circling around you tonight, maybe some people accusing you, maybe some people making life difficult for you, maybe some people that have formed themselves as a weapon against you, I encourage you to start praying that prayer. That, and believe that your God will send his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Come on. Shut the lion's mouth. Shut the lion's mouth. Shut the lion's mouth. Shut the lion's mouth. Shut that that angel is going to reach over and grab that lion at work or in your world or in your mind, and he's going to grab that lion's mouth and shut the lion's mouth. Amen? Shut the lion's mouth. i got to stop. Well, if you learned some good things tonight, would you give the Lord a good hand clap? Amen? Stand to your feet with me, please. Obedience and no compromise. Hmm? Serving God, believing and speaking, no compromise. Amen. Lift your hands towards heaven. Let's pray for a minute. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for these great miracles that cause our faith to grow. I thank you tonight, Lord, for shutting the lion's mouth in our lives. Whatever that lion is, whatever, however it may be manifesting. And Lord, we believe tonight for favor. Favor that should be reserved for others is given to us. Favor. The people go out of their way to help us, to be good to us. And they can't even explain why. Favor. I believe tonight for supernatural promotion in the lives of your children. For themselves, their families, their businesses, their companies, their jobs. Supernatural promotion. And Lord, if any of them are in the fire tonight, I believe they're going to come through the fire. No smell of smoke on them. No, we're going for it. We're believing for it. We're believing for the big things, Father. We're not going to compromise. We're going to give our miracle-working God every chance to do his thing. We're not going to bow. We're not going to bend to the God of this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed? In two minutes, you'll be gone. Two minutes, maybe you're here tonight, and you have not received Jesus into your life as your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you didn't know you could. Maybe you didn't know you should. Why would I ask you that question? Here it is plain and simple. Because we all need a Savior. And we all need a Savior because we've all sinned. There's no one in this room tonight that hasn't sinned. We've all sinned. Me, you, everyone. We've all sinned. And God took it upon himself to provide a Savior for us so that we would not live and die in our sins, but instead could live and die forgiven of our sins 
and live as children of God. And when we die, go straight to heaven. For to be absent from the body, Paul said, is to be present with the Lord. So I ask you tonight, have you done that? Can you remember a time in your life where you prayed and you received Jesus into your life as your Lord and your Savior? If you've never done that, in a moment I'm going to pray. I'm going to lead the whole church into prayer, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and Jesus will come into your life tonight and will remove the guilt of sin off of your life and make you a child of God. I can't explain all of it to, that to you tonight other than to say that's a part of what will happen, and I will gladly explain it to you as you keep coming to church and you walk in the reality of becoming a child of God. Or maybe you say to me tonight, Pastor, one time or another, I had a good relationship with the Lord, but I don't now. I compromised, I got defended, I got distracted, doesn't matter. What's important is you're here tonight, and you're hearing this, and God is knocking on the door of your heart, and he's asking you to come back to his house. So let me pray with you tonight to get back on track. Huh? So if you're going to pray with me tonight, number one, to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Number two, to get your life back on track. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. That's all I'm going to ask you to do, and then I'm going to leave the whole room in a prayer. Because I want to know if you're going to be praying for me now. Are you ready? One, Pastor, I want to become a child of God. Okay, get ready. Two, Pastor, I want to get closer to God. Okay, get ready. Three, raise your hand right now. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. Yes. Yes, yes. That la this lady over here, she raised her hand before I even got to one. Over here, I love that. So eager, so hungry for God. Anybody else before we pray? All right, all of you, raise your hands. Let's all pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I choose you. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my life. Sit on the throne of my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name, teach me how to live. Amen. Hey, welcome to the family. We gave you this card. Please take a moment and fill it out and turn it into the ushers or... Give it at the Connect Center's outside tonight. If you go to the Connect Center, we'll give you a Bible. All right, God bless you. I love you. See you this weekend, huh? Amen. Love you all. Be safe.